many there are who have never heard of the great self within. Many others, though they hear of it, fail to comprehend it. Fortunate is that one who hears of it. Wonderful is the one who speaks of it. And extremely blessed is that one who, having heard of it, from the lips of any lumen preceptor, is able to realize it here and now, in this very lifetime. Om peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto us, peace be unto all. We are now approaching the fourth class of our series on the role of memory in reincarnation. <clears throat> and we've juxtaposed, juxtaposed two phrases in Sanskrit next to each other, meaning <clears throat> this daiva smriti, which is divine memory, out of which one recalls all of the things one did <clears throat> in a conscious state in previous lifetimes that is more or less conscience. And then next to it, this phrase termed Vishmriti, which we'll look at deeper today on a chart that we've only taken once. In the case of a certain seminar we gave some months ago and which some of you might remember, but we need to go through it in a deeper sense. But up to this point, <clears throat> we've been approaching this subject of divine memory or retentive memory, recollection of past lifetimes, which is spoken of even in the Bhagavad Gita by Sri Krishna. And in Buddhist scriptures and teachings too, we find that listed as a main teaching. And we've taken it this time under the auspice of the five W's, that is basically why, what, where, when, and who. But usually when we concentrate on the five W's, we're concentrating on those first four, why, what, when, who, uh, as traps, as uh, circular thinking that people are using <clears throat> and not finding any great solution for. Why, the question why is leading to another why and so forth, sort of like a child asking a host of questions and not hearing the answers. And then who we've always set aside as a sort of special gateway into self-realization if one can all of a sudden get this detached witness look at one's inner self. Again, the distinction being between what Lord, even Lord Buddha called the small self and the great self. That is, uh, ahamkara is the small self in Sanskrit, in Vedanta, and Atman is the great self in Vedanta. But in Buddhism, you have Anatman, the non-self, and then you have Pragyaparam, or Tathagatagarbha, as an indicator in Buddhism that there is this divine presence, which is the underlying foundation of everything. So we don't want to get mixed up in terminology uh, in two darshanas of India, which are very noble and very high-minded, mainly Vedanta with its Advaitic component and, and Buddhism in all its phases. So in that way, we usually keep that word who sort of sacrosanct. But in this series of classes, we've been taking what, where, when, and why, and putting them directly in accord with this question or this theory or this uh, concept, uh, we would call it in India a relative truth called reincarnation. And in that way, <clears throat> we looked in the first class at who, uh, who is it? I'm sorry. Uh, um, well, we looked at who, yes, we did look at who, we looked at what, and we looked at why and when a little bit last week. But when we look at who and take it into this relative context, uh, the idea is who is it that's transmigrating? 
So I've heard that question come from both Buddhists and Advait and, and Vedantas. Who is it that's transmigrating? And so we looked at that to peg it, to put, to put a marker on it as the body-mind mechanism, the psychophysical being, the collection of five sheaths or koshas or upadis. I mean, there are just a number of ways in which uh, that question can be answered. But as I said last week, remember that Atman or that Pragyaparam, that Supreme Self, doesn't go through phases of transmigration. It's immovable, it's unborn, it's undying. And Krishna makes that clear in the Gita too. That, that's the Ajati premise in Advaita Vedanta, basically that principle of, of uh, nothing is ever born and nothing, therefore nothing ever dies. That's an indicator for the great self. So when we talk about something that's transmigrating, I just called it a relative law. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, a law that we have to, to sit up and take notice of, particularly if you're caught in lifetimes of, of transmigration, they call it, uh, being reborn in bodies again and again, then at some point you'd have to say, well, it looks to me like that body-mind mechanism, which is a complex of physical form, <clears throat> name, um, and uh, mind and its thought, and ego, uh, which is not yet ripened, as Sri Ramakrishna was wont to say, has formed itself into sort of a complex. Uh, antaha karana is the Sanskrit term for that, fourfold mind that drags from birth to death and death to birth the soul. That is uh, the soul here, meaning this um, transmigrating soul, because that supreme soul cannot be um, pulled out of its position of eternal abidance. It's uh, perfect and inactive and formless and divine, as the Upanishads call it. So that's the witness of this transmigrating who. Then we looked at where does it go? And we had to look at the kingdoms of heaven within then. We looked at them through Buddhism, we looked at them through Christianity, and we looked at them through um, um, yoga. And um, we saw in seven different systems, including Kundalini Yoga too, these worlds, and, and then we quickly <clears throat> moved to clarify those worlds are not outside in space because those are just planets mostly with no life on them, as we so far have concluded. So they're inner worlds. So this is where the wise practitioner would begin meditating, for instance, or would begin stopping the breath and practicing pranayama, would begin becoming very conscious of his or her movements. It's all about stopping things from happening. It basically, use the word vritti if you want, vibration. Anything that vibrates or moves, you want to arrest it as if you're some kind of a, an overlord or, a, or police. You say, I arrest you to stay in one place. I'm going to make you like your father in heaven. If you want to use that term, I want to make you still, quiet, peaceful, immovable, stationary. And um, we looked right away at the where of things then, where it thinks it's going. We just make that one addition to that. It's going inside always, just like your dreams are going inside tonight. And in fact, we, we feel that the kings of heaven are your dreams. Where else are you going to find these worlds but in your own mind? So we rush to qualify that in the mind-only schools. All, all of this is taking place in the great mind. The collective mind follows the great mind. The individual minds follow the collective mind. And then you've got Vyasti and Samasti and Vyapi, basically, they call them Sanskrit. These three levels of consciousness. Also, sometimes they'll put it in terms of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So all of this is a beautiful mesh in Indian Dharma and in the teachings of Atmagyan. 
And in Hinduism, in Vedanta, in yoga and so forth, you, they don't really put much of an emphasis on rebirth. You might have noticed Buddhism does, particularly Tibetan Buddhism came along and began to examine where the soul was going, its tokus and its rinpoches and, and so forth. Uh, the arhats back in Buddhist time were looking at, at what is it that seems to be moving and we've come to find out that it's not really moving, it's just kind of dreaming that it moves. And so they make these dindimas, you know, these siddhantas, these conclusions that consciousness is still and unmoving, doesn't go anywhere, but the mind dreams itself to places. So that's the, the who and where of the whole five, five Ws, you see. And then I think over the last class and a half, we looked together at why and when, because those two can't really be separated, I found. I thought, well, if I just, if I just say, when is it transmigrating? Time is <laughs> when. And time is also an illusion in the mind, so it's very hard to say any, in any given point where the soul is going to all of a sudden enter into this dream, or as they say, cut the silver cord and not come back to the body anymore. Whether it be in conscious meditation, like Buddha in Mahanirvana just gave up the body, or Christ in the wilderness, or Muhammad in the desert, or, or um, you know, any of these beings that gave up the body consciously, that is a great, uh, a great moment then. Because they have practiced stopping all these processes like thinking, acting, moving, breathing, and so forth, before they came to that moment where they said, I'm now going to cut this silver cord, or the silver thread, sometimes they call it. And, uh, but also then, other beings are meditating, trying to make this sense of I go away, I go away, I do, I think, I act, I am. The I am, of course, gets a little closer again to the, the truth of the matter. But um, any, any time when that sense of I insinuates itself in on the meditation, uh, that's, that's where this, um, this line of demarcation between soul and God is some, all of a sudden appears. And, and if it's in a ripe soul, Sharma Krishna called that a line drawn on water, it'll just go away right away. The, and they'll, they'll see that's not true, that the soul is God, and that's Advaita, and that's oneness, and all that happy good stuff. Uh, but if it's the ego isn't ripe, then you find that that's a stick laid across that water of consciousness, and, and it stays there a long time. That's the unripe ego that's causing itself a distinction between the soul and God. And even inside of that, it can be very refined. Like dualism can be a very beautiful philosophy with lots to add into the quotient of religion and philosophy in India, and a lot, lot to give us in terms of wisdom. But then if dualism becomes fundamentalism, and it becomes narrowness, and then it becomes the ego is the only, the small ego is the only thing that exists, and there is no great self, there's just a small self, or all the way down to, I don't even think about self. You see, I'm just a body with senses running around enjoying objects, materialism basically then that whole side of that stick line laid across that water of consciousness, you know, creates many, many more divisions or many, many more ripples and waves on that side of consciousness. Meanwhile, on the side of ripened ego, the merging has always happened. I'll show you that in a minute. It's called Koivalya Pragbara, souls that hit that apparent line of demarcation and draw a line on water. They'll wait for that line to go away They'll take their opportunity and they'll jump right into oneness with Brahman because that's the truth of the matter. That's why we call rebirth a relative law, not an absolute law. So I was about saying that uh, hard to separate why from when. So we looked more at the why of it last week. Why is it reincarnating? And we found out that this complex body-mind mechanism creates complexes because it repeats things too much. Uh, repeti repetition is a good thing when you hear the teachings over and over again, we like to say, uh, because you'll hear the teachings in a sattvic moment or 
in a balanced moment, a yogically balanced moment, and it'll make such great sense to you, and that'll that'll go a long ways into dissolving delusion and confusion and and ignorance and so forth. Uh, but you'll hear it at other times when the mind is restless or the mind is dull, and it it will just uh, bounce off of the interior of the mind. It won't get digested. I'll show you the curtain of nations later today, how, how, what, which keeps people like an elastic bound, bouncing back to the three worlds. They can't get beyond their ancestors, as Lord Buddha taught, of this kind of less elastic membrane, as it were, inside of ourselves, that the, that the transmigrating soul comes up again, and like a slingshot, all of a sudden, you know, shoots it back to earth to be born again and again with beings who are as ignorant and unawakened as uh, the soul itself is. So that's the why, why, when of the matter. Why is, is a good question then, if it can be asked, um, why is it transmigrating? Uh, because it has these hidden complexes in it. So that's where we're picking up this week in the class, fourth class, because we looked last week at the end at one samsara, that's the key word here, some, sorry, samskara, uh, the two are so related, samskara and samsara. But uh, we looked at one chart on samskaras, which are these mental complexes. Just think of something, uh, doing something over and over again, and then retaining a memory of it. The best story I heard was Sri Krishna's cows going back and forth to the barn, you know, every day. And they, they use the same pathway. So pretty soon they just wear this rut into the ground from the barn to the pasture and back. And, you know, after a few months, it's hoof deep. After a few more months, it's like shin deep, knee deep. And so they're wearing this large groove. And Sri Krishna said, that's like a samskara in the mind. So, so we looked at that chart last week, and we saw all of these samskaras in the mind in terms of race, culture and we're going on with that so that we can make sure to make some headway along this um, these other um, two w questions why is it transmigrating uh, of course if you had strong willpower uh, you, you could stop it from doing that vivekananda says um, imagine right now you're just sitting right so what is movement it's will, basically. So you could will yourself to stand up right now. So you think, I'm going to stand up. Your will translates that to your body. Your body gets the, the idea from the mind, the thought, the thought, then translates to the muscles and organs and everything. And you can all of a sudden, like magic, move your body around the room. You can't do that with other people's bodies. You can only do it with your own. And they themselves, each in their own way, are moving their own bodies around by their own wills. So this, think of that when you think of this samskara that's in the mind that's moving everything. Uh, and the whole body-mind mechanism goes from birth to death and death to birth through this limited willpower. The question is sometimes been asked, is, is there, does mankind have uh, supreme will or free will? And the question always comes back from the Indian series, no. You've got relative free will. So supreme will is only when you make your small will, that small self, one with a great self or the great will of the Divine Mother of the universe, then she moves you. You don't move yourself anymore. And they have different songs, slokas, sutras, scriptures, the seers, in which they describe just being taken over. Just read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, and you can hear him say, well, she turned me into like a pops, popsicle stick figure tied together by strings. I was like a wooden puppet, you see. I don't think they had popsicles back there. Who knows? But that's what we would look at this day and age, making these popsicle stick figures with tied together with strings, and somebody's pulling the strings. So that's how Sri Ramakrishna described when the supreme will of the Divine Mother got a hold of him and moved him here and there, and he had no say in it and nothing to do about it. So that's how they feel when the, this takes over them. So I'm using this analogy uh, to imagine or to give credence to the fact that this body-mind mechanism has a will of its own. 
And that's, it's relying upon these samskaras back inside of it, in the greater mind. Uh, and if those samskaras we know are positive, then it could, it could have a conscious birth or it could deny going back to the realm of the ancestors against its will and it could keep itself disembodied. I mean, there are many beautiful realms beyond the three lokas, that is beyond the three worlds, beyond the three chakras. How We looked at seven of those systems a couple of weeks ago that a human being can move to that doesn't have to come back to this three worlds of physical reincarnation on this world. Also, that it stops short of full enlightenment. So there's a whole cross-section of worlds or chakras or realms or lokas, bardos, in which the soul can go to where it doesn't need to return to earth. It's given up its desire for things of the earth. So that's a willpower. It's like more like getting towards that line drawn on water where the ego is just through with childish things. It's put away childish things, as even the Western savants have said. And, and, uh, and Christianity says that too. It, it grows up and it grows up spiritually. So now it can conduct its own affairs inside of these more blissful realms. Um, and the curtain of nations has been thinned so much that these souls can pass through inside of themselves, just like you would pass into a dream or pass into beyond dreaming state to a causal state, dreamless sleep, that easily and come forth that easily. That's that kind of uh, economy of movement and, and uh, flexibility of uh, the, the soul that has, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, cut the sandbags off the hot air balloon. It can, now, it can now be buoyant and float into the higher sky of awareness. So I'm trying to give you again a little bit of an introduction to the word samskara, and we'll take up a second chart now about it. If you remember, you'll have to think back with your own divine memory, your own retentive memory, to that chart that we had last week about some scars and what it held in it. Basically, it, it had a lot of, it, it described a lot of impressions like rude ignorance, the tendency towards rebirth in cycles, uh, uh, dividing itself to be under the auspice of gender, uh, becoming uh, you know a, a body and then choosing its sex, and uh, its personality is also run through and through by these samskaras. Uh, we also looked at the samskara for desire, for pleasure, and power. We looked at the. Um, I'm, I'm reading from last week's chart, which you don't see right now, just to remind you, there's also some scars of craving, ego obsession, the urge to dominate other other souls, and body identification. These, these words I'm saying right now are actually describing the subtle residue, residue that's in a samskara, that's in the mind, that causes it to go from place to place and choose in this matter. And uh, as, you, as we went through that last chart, you can see that some people can um, refine the samskars of their mind. They can get beyond name, fame, attraction to wealth, and uh, restlessness and laziness. That's a mixed samskara. Then pretty soon you have uh, beings who are being very um, honest to their vows around morality and ethics. They have a proper orientation in life, and they like to try and serve others self selfless, selflessly, like altruism. Then we looked at some, um, some scars that were of actions, merits, and deeds. <clears throat> That's a very interesting one. <clears throat> because it uh, describes to you why it is that you do what you do and why other people do what they do, which is very hard, hard to figure out. It's, it's like 
uh, you have to use a kind of yoga psychology in India to try and figure out why people do what they do, how they think, and so that you can get them out of these out of developing these crystallized complexes that route them into transmigration for lifetimes. You have to break those. Snap the chains of birth and death is one beautiful song in our tradition we use. But Sri Ramakrishna is, is the uh, destroyer of the chains of birth and death. So he'll help you snap those. You can come out of that, and you'll come out of it with mental capacity and intelligence. Uh, that's what they look for. <laughs> that's the, that's the first, uh, first of seven qualifications in Tantra, Daksha. If you walk into a Tantra teacher's, an authentic Tantra teacher's ashram or center, they'll be looking at you, does he or she have intelligence? And they'll test you about that. Can they understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And can they go deep with them? Uh, study the scriptures, memorize them, and get something of the essence of the thing. If that test is passed, then the next level of samskara that you'll see the almost free soul in possession of is the desire to serve others, wisdom already inherent in the soul, compassion for the suffering of others, peace of mind, and this radiance that comes off of them, illumination. That's a very positive samskara, and that, that contributes to divine life. Uh, yes, it's still divine life in the body, but this will help one to, to destroy the chains of birth and death and move towards a conscious embodiment, which the Buddhists would say would be your first conscious death, leading to your first conscious lifetime. That's, they're looking for that, too. So I just ran through in a few minutes the chart that we looked at at the end of last Sunday's class, so you would be on the right page. Now let's look at this new chart. Um, and hopefully I got it out here for myself. It's called the makeup of the samskara. And for that, we have to add a few syllables to our already new word that we're learning, some of us, samskara, mental impression. Uh, and it's uh, skanda is the two syllables. So it's a, it's a collection of samskaras. I used to describe it as, as uh, you know, nails in a bucket uh, that rust together. So somebody, some workman leaves, I saw this happen once, workman leaves um, a bucket out in the, in the rain, uh, in the middle of a job, on the lot, building a house or something goes away, it doesn't come back for several weeks as the rain goes on and on, comes back and sees these nails are starting to attest to each other and rust together, has to pull them out with a hammer, break them apart, and so he can use them. So uh, in that way, that's like the rusty nails of a lot of different kinds of thought, which I just described to you. Um, the rust of consciousness has been mentioned by Lord Buddha, rust of monasteries, is the lack of recitation of scripture, he said, the rust of households, the lack of spiritual self-effort. I mean, it's in the Dhammapada. It's a very beautiful quote. So this rust, if it adheres, then it begins to collect one samskara to another samskara, and that's where you get called psychosis, you see, in this, in this day and age. So basically, personality and all these things get together around this array of various tendencies in the human mind, many of them not very healthy, sometimes none of them very healthy, uh, because if you had healthy samskaras, this adhesion of samskaras in the mind would not happen. You'd be able to deal with one at a time with your practice. Oh, I have that problem, shine the laser on it, it's gone, never to return. And now I'll go on to the next one. Sri Krishna said it's like bubbles together, you see. They rise to the surface with bubbles, and one big one, two littler ones, three, three or four tiny ones. Uh, if you could just pop that middle bubble of the samskara we're talking about, then all these other samskaras would be dispersed, and you could easily get at them. But if it comes together as a skanda, then it's very hard to get at that main one, because you're being distracted all the time by these little bubbles 
of other habits and problems that are, how do they say it, uh, fires you need to put out first. So all of this to, be, to, to explain what a, a skanda is. So Lord Buddha says here, the discerning person, I think we had this last week, the discerning person uh, straightens the mind, which is fickle, unsteady, and difficult to restrain. Just like the skilled Fletcher straightens the shaft of an arrow. I remember this from last week. What we did then to end the class, because we were running out of time, was look at the inset box at the lower right-hand side of the chart. That's worth going over again. Some facts about some scars is that they form due to ego, uh, egoic desire-based actions in past lives. It couldn't be any clearer than that. This is how they form. They lie dormant, unnoticed, and are hard to detect or neutralize. And that's why people, if you're asking the why question here again, uh, that's why people um, do not progress spiritually or do not arrive at a certain place where they can see that all of this is a play and that only God is real. See, it's all a play in Maya. I shouldn't take it so seriously. I should detach from it and know that only God is real. God's the only reality. They can't do this for that very reason um, because these samskars are dormant and unnoticed. When they do get a look at them, they don't like it. <laughs> it's like getting a look at your true nature it isn't always uh, isn't always so a happy a thing because your true nature is masquerading as other things first, and you're going to have to strip away the false superimposition of the unreal before you can actually get a good look at the real. If you're not acclimatized to see the real, it's like looking straight at the sun without sunglasses at first. So you have to, by stages, by avastas, prepare the mind slowly to be able to sit in the light of the truth or the light of who you truly are and accept yourself that way. These operate in tandem with time, karma, and life's occurrences. You see, the worst possible things come up at the worst possible times, right? And so that's all in this mic complex. Very difficult to get free because of that inauspicious timing. They influence present life behavior for better or for worse. And we know nowadays, quite often things are happening for the worse in this world. So uh, if people knew the art of some scars, if it was taught in schools, if parents knew it when they raised their children, and if they knew practices that yoga and Vedanta and Buddhism and other great systems of India teach to, to, to uh, break apart those rusty nails of some scars, skandhas, uh, and to purify the mind, uh, to lead it on towards transcendence, at least towards a more divine life, uh, then you'd see this behavior change in people, in races, in cultures. In the meantime, there's a lot of shooting in the dark and we'll hope we get lucky kind of philosophy out there. These samskara skandhas congeal into, or actually this is just samskaras. These samskaras congeal into a deeper complex if not dissolved. That's the samskara skanda. So you want to dissolve those quickly. How? Because that's a question that we need to take up. It's not a W question, but uh, that's a method question. And that's very valuable. So we need to shine the light of our, with our practices of yoga. Because yoga is the best of all purificatory practices in the world. Yoga is the best. It'll take all levels of your being, not just the physical, but the vital energy with food and then the thought energy with the mind, the psychology, uh, then the intellect with its refinement, finally will go on up to the spiritual per se, and will give you practices and teachings from enlightened souls, from a darshana that's thousands of years old and has been recently resurrected uh, by Patanjali, the father of yoga, into this masterful system. What can I say? Read my book. It's about to come out. He took a hundred, hundred or so souls from the West and had them do a 10-year-long practice of authentic 
Raja Yoga or Patanjala Yoga, eight-limbed yoga. And uh, the result was all taken down. It's, it's in two volumes now. So we're about to put that out. You can see how people have dealt with this life-transforming practice called yoga, yoga psychology, how advanced it is, how deep it goes, and how freeing it is. So this comes to mind when we think about this uh, um, forming of skandhas. Before that happens, quick, you take each one of your samskaras, subject it to the practices of yoga under the auspice of your teacher. You cannot do it alone without a teacher. You can do some of it part of, partially part of the time, but guru, dharma, and sangha go together as a triple gem. There's the teacher should be illumined and well-versed in these scriptures. There is the sangha which supports you and you support it back on all levels, uh, not just with time, but with finances. And then there's the Dharma itself, which is, which is one of the three gems of Buddhism too. Uh, it's this wisdom that's eternal that you need to tap into. Because you're getting, as we discussed yesterday, you're getting the Aparavijja, but you're not getting the Paravijja yet. And you're learning a lot by example from people who are adharmic, but not looking at people who are dharmic, who, who set the way towards spirituality. So all of this has to be changed. And you use your willpower to do that, by the way. So you remove these samskaras by mental and spiritual purification. Basically, that's yoga's best way. Asana and pranayam, a, a mere start. They often remain in residual form until samadhi occurs. So if you can um, narrow them down and their effects and influences on your life until you begin to have samadhi of objects, samadhi of thoughts, samadhis of ripened self. These are all yogic teachings, different savi, kalpa, samadhi, or different seeded uh, samadhis called sampragyata in yoga, then you'll see these residual, you can dissolve these residual, um, these residues. They cause the soul's transmigration in continual cycles. Put that one together with the first one, and you pretty much got the whole explanation of what a samskara is. That is, they're formed by egoic desire-based actions, and they cause the soul's transmigration in cycles. Accept that much. Look at the rest of it and work it out for yourself. They also dis dictate all the details of the next life's manifestation. So you, you, know, you think you're, this life is the only life, but it's based upon having other lives. And it will also, this life will be based upon your future lives and how you'll act and think and navigate through the different levels of consciousness in a future lifetime <coughs> with three kinds of karma that go with that, by the way, past, present, and future karmas. All right, there in the left-hand side, you see the subtle body of a stereotypical person. That's pointing out a brain, but it's really a mind what we're talking about here. And you see in the mind the symbol there, which is, which, which is, which is a thought cloud that they use in, in Buddhist teachings. This thought cloud there has different little markings in it. You can see by the guide below, there are negative impressions in it, which are those black marks. There is these minus signs in it, which are mixed impressions. And there's these I signs in it, which are positive impressions. Um, so you can see around, as we go around this, transmigrating mind complex. Um, we can just pick a few of these. It's attached to pleasure and in pursuit of wealth. So that's a black mark on it. It's not going to develop uh, interest in Dharma and spirituality yet under the auspice of that. Um, personality is there in genealogy. We already looked at that. The next black one there is tendency towards addiction due to substance abuse in previous lives. So uh, intoxicants, elixirs, that's been called down by the father of Vedanta and by the father of yoga both um, as um, 
something that um, will deter you from the spiritual goal. So people are actually born with these addictions, even though they don't show it at first. You just wait. It's there as a samskara in the mind, a tendency. As soon as they go out and mix with people, they'll uh, identify with that particular person who has that ability to give them what they want because they're still in the problem of egoic, desire-based actions from past lifetimes. So this is why holy company is immediately important. Send your children to these holy company to get these samskaras removed. Be careful, and some people in the world are still aware of this, be careful of the company that your children keep, especially at a young age, where they might run into somebody whom you could put the blame on and, and, and see the faults in. But the fact is that your child got attracted there to that person. So it's not just a one-sided thing. You're going to have to take your child and work on the past impressions of his or her lifetime at an early age with these practices that will cause them later to look at a, at a situation like that and detach from it. Because there are people who are saying, no, I don't really want to go keep company with that group of people or with that person. I'm not attracted to that. So they're already free of those weights of some scars. And uh, their, their uh, higher some scars are, are there in the body-mind mechanism as it goes from day to day, month to month, lifetime to lifetime. So this is uh, important. And then uh, here's another one. Practice religion in a past existence and has the potential for awakening. So you see naturally that people, uh, some of them are attracted to religion. Some of them are attracted to even dharma, which is beyond just religion and, or morality and ethics. And some are attracted actually towards enlightenment itself. They, they came here to get enlightened, working out a few of their past karmas, i.e., some scars. They're going to neutralize karmas and some scars. Another one here is due to suffering in the past lives has developed some power of forbearance. You see people who have uh, strength of will, as I was just talking about. A darker one is it's vain and attached to surface beauty. So they're not seeing that beauty of the light that dwells within yet. We'll look at this box that comes next at the top of the chart um, after we look at a few more of these tendencies. Is forgetful due to lack of study in a previous lifetime. So that's why we want uh, Swadhyaya, we, we want study of scriptures in our youth in Vedanta these days and in those who are attracted to these life affirming teachings of spirituality uh, and of true religion. Irreligion has, we have a problem with that. So um, that's why sometimes people are forgetful. And forgetful is a good word to use here because that's right to the main point of our, of our title of our series here, that we want this retentive mind, not this forgetful mind. We'll look more about that soon. Nevertheless, there's a, another samskara to be watered in the mind that this person has a potential for intellectual acumen. Oops, it has a habit of laziness, so it's unable to mature. Uh, on the other hand, it's humble, but also insecure. And then just a very practical one there, drowned in a past lifetime, so is afraid of water. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why people are the way they are. And this mind cloud here is... Uh, is showing that people are a lot more on the inside than you would look to see on the outside that you would assume. So which one of these samskaras is going to come to the fore? Which one's going to be watered in the wrong way? Which one's going to get the sunlight of understanding in the right way? Um, and as we move back to some of these other ones here, see, that would make them kind and generous. On the other hand, 
they could be born with physical problems that worsen as age sets in. So a good potpourri there of samskaras, positive, mixed, and negative. And you can see how skandhas would play into it. Let's look at that box that we passed by in our exploration here of this chart. Samskara skandhas consist of a combination of conventional beliefs, parental and gender issues, tendency to brood and worry, inability to love or be loved, fear, especially of death, and the mind's falling into lower habits, animalistic types of tendencies. We mentioned that last week. So all of these things can come together to make this samskara skanda that you see at the very center of that cloud mind image that we're using. It's got a lot of potential problems now because the samskara skanda is going to take more effort to break through. That's why you probably need the grace of a guru and the grace of your own mind, Holy Mother said. Because she said she saw people with a desire to be free. Uh, they uh, could study well and uh, and uh, they, they had a, a tendency towards yearning for God realization. But none of those came to fruition, she said, in that particular person or people because of this um, this uh, um, betrayal of their own mind, betrayal of their own mind. You have to get your own mind on your side, she said. It's a very beautiful teaching in Vedanta. Well, we, we went through this to explain the rest of the why, when um, portion of re rebirth or reincarnation. Uh, and at the bottom, Sri Ramakrishna has this story that's very funny. A son of a king was fond of playing with his royal playmates. One day, as they were playing swords, which you'd think a son of a king would, would like to do, he suddenly put down the sword and said, let's play a new game. I'll lay down, and all of you must beat me over the back with these clothes and robes, making a swishing sound as you do. And so Sri Ramakrishna explains, you see, in his last lifetime, he was the, prin the prince had been the son of a washerman. So that's a samskara mention that Sri Ramakrishna is getting. It's a very subtle one that a prince should be thinking about noble things and domination and going to war or ruling his, his country peacefully and, and with sovereignty and generosity, all the good samskaras or mixed samskaras or bad samskaras that are there. Instead, he's thinking about, all of a sudden in the midst of play, he's thinking about a, a memory that came to him from a past lifetime where he, time after time, uh, the washer man used him as a stone <laughs> to, to beat him with his clothes in the river to get the clothes clean. See. And so he, he actually had a samskara for that, including the swishing sounds uh, that it made all day as he heard these things come down on him. So you could just use that as a very funny and simple example of all the experiences that people pass through in their past lifetimes and in the beginning of this lifetime that they can't even remember now because their memories are not very sound. I've mentioned before in the past that in, in India, basically, the people can trace their lineage back all the way to great souls like Krishna or to the solar line. And they think of their whole family line as being thousands of years long, all with an origin back with these great souls. So they don't just stop at, I'm the father of a son of a worshipman, or uh, I mean, the, uh, the son of a worshipman. Uh, they don't stop at, you know, I have an ancestral line that I came through, or I'm, I mean, I, I came from a line of doctors or scientists or lawyers and so forth. They go beyond that to their true origin, as far as lifetimes are concerned, which would be all the way back to these great souls out of which 
they came because all of us came from the one soul, you see. That's our source of origin, the Atman, it's called in our tradition. Now, as time begins to flow by, let's look at um, a how, because we mentioned how, right? So let's look at a how question um, that we can insert here in the midst of this. Now that we've been good, attentive students and we've concentrated on these very still obscure and hardly known internal mental ingredients called samskaras. Yes, you could call them complexes, but complexes usually are seen in just one lifetime they build up. So you could sort of see them build up and hopefully you can do something to get rid of them in Western psychotherapy and psychology and so forth. But we see in India, it really goes a lot deeper and takes a long view and a long, a long look back. And there have been many practices along the way, which have allowed not just for snapping the chains of rebirth, but also for getting enlightenment. That is setting yourself up for enlightenment once the initial work has been done. So um, in this case, there's this example of one of them, this seven point burning pillar meditation of Lord Vairochana. So it says here in the quote from um, a Tibetan teacher that I got to learn from some, he says, as the points are initiated one by one, lower to higher, the body perspires, the life force heats up and the minds uh, lower thoughts expire. Soon, one's entire being is purified. He rests in shane, calm abiding. Then he becomes a burning pillar of light that benefits all sentient beings who reside in the many upper and lower spheres of existence. Remember those? As we looked at them a couple classes ago, all of this uh, worlds that are in the mind. They're, they're divided into lower and medium and higher whether you look at them as patalas and chakras, or whether you look at them as bardos or lokas, they're, they're a subdivision of consciousness that is vibrating at different levels. It's like one big ocean that's vast and unbound and indivisible and homogenous. At the same time, it's got depths, it's got shallows, and, and it's got surface waves. And so this ocean of great mind is vibrating all the time. Um, hopefully we can stay as close to that mahat, they call it, the great mind as possible in our series of lifetimes. Um, and therefore never need to be forced to come into rebirth against our will um, and enter into the realms of samsara pragbara or uh, samsara itself. So this chart shows a soul sitting there meditating with this flame within it. And this is the burning pillar, pillar it's called. And, and the, the, the Tibetan teacher just described to us how, what happens when you put yourself here. And so you sit in this tripod position in yoga uh, and that automatically starts to open up channels in the spine that have long been closed and the kundalini energy, they call it, or even just the prana, can begin to uh, rise. Rise means go inward and uh, be attracted, especially if you can put the mind with it, the, inner, the prana and the mind with it. And it should be a natural thing in most cases, like it is with children sometimes, if you sit them in this tripod position that they'd all of a sudden just go into the state and it's sometimes a little bit difficult to even call them back. And when you do, they say, you know, they, they experienced great peace and saw some light and so forth. So sometimes for older people, this takes some practice so that these things begin to occur to you, consciousness again. Upanishad will even give um, descriptions of it. Oh, sometimes it's like the tingling of a bell or sometimes it's like the beating of a deep kettle drum. Sometimes it's like flashes of lightning. Sometimes it's like fireflies. These are actually 
ways in which the ancient rishis described consciousness that's about to catch fire, catch the fire of yoga. And you'll never know, uh, because of some scars and so forth, uh, what will happen to a person if you can get a hold of them and give them this practice. That's why we continue to teach the Dharma, so that people can uncover these samskaras, particularly the positive ones, and the children too need to recall their positive samskaras. And they need to recall it in the context of what I'm talking about here, is that it, it goes back before this lifetime. For instance, that description is furthered here by the Karmapa, who is my Tibetan teacher. He said, you may have the 84,000 teachings of the Buddha, but if you do not know how to sit in the seven-point posture, then you cannot progress on the path of enlightenment. So, sounds a little harsh. Well, there's no reason why you can't possess, I mean, progress on the path of purification. There's no reason why you can't progress on the path of religion. There's no reason why you can't progress on the path of practice and prayer and bhakti. There's no reason why you can't, you can't, you can't. But you follow the path to enlightenment, you're going to find yourself up against a teacher who wants to burn away all the conditionings, i.e. some scars, that are in your mind that are still keeping you from seeing the truth that the self is the only reality and it's formless. In other words, there'll come a time when birds have nests, foxes have holes, but you don't have any place to lay your head here. You'll want to get beyond name and form, just like you do in your deep sleep state tonight. So, no, let's not take the karmapa and be too critical, critical of what he says. He's speaking specifically of this very high level of yogic practice and Tibetan Buddhism. On the other side, he says, may the waves of coarse thoughts subside on their own. May the river of mind become placid and gently come to rest. May the ocean of serene abidance free of contaminants, offer up its depths. Beautiful. So those three things would be nine. What's he talking about there, right? The body-mind mechanism, basically. Your thoughts, your mind, and your consciousness. Now, the Shanae itself, let's say we were taking it up to Shanae because we want to destroy some scars in our mind. We don't quite know what those some scars are, because they're very difficult to point out. Shall we go back and reason and say why? And look at all the 10 reasons why these some scars are hidden and obscure. Uh, no, I'll leave that for you to look back on if you need to repeat it, which is good. But basically the practice happens like this from the bottom up. The legs are held in a crossed position. Now remember, we're taking this up as a way of becoming a burning pillar Right now, our main concern is that we want to burn away impurities inside this body-mind mechanism that's holding some scars and karmas. And the building, this burning pillow will do that. Um, and that's why we go back to John Gong Kantro Rinpoche's teaching here. He says, first you perspire, and the life force heats up the body, and the mind starts having uh, its thoughts expire. Uh, so keep these quotes all together as you take up this instruction from this tradition and keep it in the context of I'm entering into this right now to destroy these some scars and karmas that I can't see in my mind. Later I'll become a burning pillar to light up Buddha nature, in this case, or Brahman, to everyone you'll just naturally exude the light like Swami Vivekananda did according to Swami, according to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Exude that light. So legs held in a crossed position, hands are placed together, palms up, 
right on top of the left, held four fingers, fingers above the, uh, the navel, approximately. And so you've, if you look at Swami Vivekananda's meditation picture, one of his best, you'll see him sitting in this position. So, his, of course, Tibet got this from India and gave it its own turn. The third level is the back is held straight, shoulders slightly back, elevated like the wings of a bird. So you don't want to scrunch over, clip any of that prana that might come up, even the physical spine, what to speak of the internal spine, uh, called the shishumna. The chin then gets tucked in slightly. So you can just do this exercise right now. Just have your head fall forward as a weight, you see, you feel uncomfortable, but if you all of a sudden just tuck your chin back in, even an inch or two, and you can see how you can go back and forth with that, you can feel how everything just gets released and you feel like uh, energy could reach your brain. But to speak of oxygen reaching your brain, energy can reach your mind. Here the eyes are kept half open, focusing beyond the tip of the nose. The tip of the tongue rests lightly on the upper palate, and the head is tilted slightly forward, and all movement is arrested. Like I started out talking earlier about arresting all the movements of the body, the thoughts of the mind, the movement of the prana. You're, you're the spiritual police. You're going to arrest all these things and make them obey you. And what happens then across the board when this is this position is initiated first the prana of evacuation enters the central channel destroying jealousy then the prana of water enters the central channel reducing anger then the prana of earth enters the central channel as the shumna dispersing ignorance then the prana of fire enters the central channel attenuating desire, then the prana of air enters the central channel, ending pride, then the prana of ether enters the central channel, removing distraction. Finally, the prana flow is ceased completely, and one abides in the stillness of shene, inner peace. And all of those across the board will be seen what happens, and you can envision this and practice it day to day by looking across the board, these two bo inset boxes here, you are that meditating figure in the middle where this fire, which we would call in our tradition, Kundalini Yoga, is ascending up the chakras, the center, spiritual centers, opening the way and uh, thinning out the curtain of nescience, which is what we want to go to next if we have the time. Now, Lama Wangchuk says this at the bottom, the point of Shine practice is to attain undistracted awareness. Therein the mind ceases to be attracted to outer phenomena. It ceases to think about the past, present, or the future moment. It does not worry about good meditation or bad meditation, for the thought I am meditating has vanished for good. So, this is a good summation of, you might say, how the mind that was impeded by some scars, which we've now studied fairly deeply in, in an hour and a half, and, and weighed down by karmic residue uh, from past lifetimes, uh, gets annulled. And then one simply needs to hold on to this practice until all such things are dissolved completely. So here again, I mean, at the retreat in a few weeks in Portland, we'll be probably looking at seven or eight different ways like this of dissolving the mind stream. So it's called dissolving the mind stream in different Indian darshanas. Uh, if, if you hold this as a goal, even if it's a penultimate goal, is that you want the mind to stop thinking, you want the body to be pure, you want the senses to be pure, you want the energy to flow unimpeded, 
Om Mapiyantu Mamangani Vak Pranas Chakshuhu Shotra Matra Balamindriyani Chasarvani. You know the drill, you know the chant. If you want all that to happen, then you're going to dissolve the mind. It's going to be one of the main things on your mind until it does dissolve, then it won't be on your mind anymore. So basically, the mind itself has to be taught. And as it does, this divine memory will come forward. So that's where we want to go next. I'm just going to move on because despite running out of time, we can at least broach this main chart that we want to look at. And we might look at it next week, depending on our time, uh, in terms of what we call the curtain of nations in our tradition. And I described a little bit about it. That, um, in fact, in Kundalini tradition, this is called the uh, uh, Vishnu Granti. Um, to even awaken spiritually, they say the Brahma Granti needs to be penetrated. So that's why you do these practices, focus at the base of the spine, which is called the Muladhara. And uh, then you uh, you do this practice like the shane, or you do a, a, a yoga uh, a, a practice that's specific to to the Kundalini yoga tradition. And uh, you're you, you're wanting to get to the mind and dissolve its limitations, its conditionings, i.e., samskaras, karmas, so forth. And so you're going to have to step up towards this deeper. Um, principle called mind complex, mental complex. And so you're going to do this with these practices. So um, in this way, one will have to pierce through the Brahma Granti, it says the Yoga Kundalini Upanishad, and then pierce through the Vishnu Granti. That's just at the Manipura center, third center. If it does that, it can roam free, it can soar free in the heart chakra, because we're using the body just to kind of align this. It's, this is all happening in these great worlds within you as your consciousness um, soars deep into that. But if it can't soar beyond that, not, granti means not, it gets thrown back into this cycle of rebirth. You can see how pertinent this is to our subject the last four weeks and how we'll have to try and wrap this up next week and next Sunday. But you can see why I threw at you all of a sudden something like the burning pillar, uh, which might have seemed out of contact with you. You were studying about some scars and karmas, but the how has to be put in here, you see. My teacher used to say that. What, where, when, why, there is who, if we can get to it. But somewhere in between what, where, when, and why, there's this how. It's not a W. Uh, but the, he used to say to me all the time, that's a method. We need a method in this day and time. Uh, we can't just leave it to chance that this may happen by randomly practicing a few of these exercises that we read in a book or heard, heard on the YouTube or heard from some teacher who probably hasn't realized them himself because they're already telling you're already perfect, you're already perfect, but you know you're not. The body-mind mechanism is never perfect, neither is the ego. They have to go till you can get to that Atman, which is the perfection in everything, and you can identify fully with it uh, as you used to identify with things imperfect. Now you're identifying with the perfect entity or consciousness or awareness itself unadulterated by conditionings like some scars and so forth. So we have to return to this chart. I showed it at the beginning four Sundays ago of this series where we're looking at mind and memory, at my memory and its role in, uh, in uh, rebirth, in the, pro the process, or we could call it even the problem of rebirth right now. Because in the West, we're not thinking in terms of having many births. Back in Arjuna's time, Krishna was on the battlefield explaining to Arjuna that he had had many births, and this was new news to him. He probably had heard of that being born in India and having heard of great souls. Uh, uh, 
uh, and knew something generally about it, unlike us in the West, probably don't think of it, but here and now, we're coming back with these, these um, weights attending upon us, and we find it hard to get free, breathe free, think free, and uh, reach a living liberated state called Jivan Mukta, as my teacher used to, used to say, Jivan Mukti. So put it this way, unillumined minds project their crystallized mental complexes into numerous bodies over cycles of time. With the exception of souls possessing resilient memories, passing through the curtain of nescience between the realm of the ancestors and the earth plane strips all past life remembrances from them. So it'd be like, you know, coming to across, walking across a country and reaching a border, and you've got all these things you want to take into the next country, and they take them all away from you, <laughs> and they keep them. So these are the thieves, you see. So you go into the next country with nothing. The next country means earth, and you're in a body, and you have nothing. You're born with nothing, uh, and then you have parents, hopefully good ones, and so forth and so on, and you begin building a lifetime of memories, conditionings on that particular new life thinking, uh, well, let's put it this way, not knowing at all what has just been taken away from you by passing through the curtain of nescience when you came into the body this time. Now there are souls that can remember everything, obviously because when they come here, they have retentive memory like Shankara. They remember the scriptures at the age of eight, like Sri Krishna hearing anything could know it for the rest of his life having heard it once so it's immediate recall in these souls uh, and it's an example to us uh, that this is what we should be doing this is a practice that we should be uh, engaging in and uh, there are methods i'm saying there are methods and it, it's actually a very beautiful thing, too, for, say, Shankar, you just mentioned him. So he talks about it, and his students talk about this, because Shankar was teaching them uh, how, how uh, the process of birth, life, and rebirth uh, is to be transcended. And then they could even be on earth in a body and live in an ecstatic state. That's that Jivan Mukti I just mentioned. So one of his students wrote this, for instance. this way. Why worry about others, O oh crazy mind? Does not the Lord ordain everything without exception? In these three worlds, it is only association with the holy that is most worthy and provides a boat to carry you across the sea of birth and death. So, yeah, beautiful. Uh, Nichinath, I think, wrote that verse, one of Shankara's many direct disciples back in 700 AD time, you see. And Shankara, most of his students were two times, three times older than he was. He was this young, great soul who'd remembered everything from his past lifetimes by the time he was six, eight, ten years old and was beginning to teach graybeards. It was an amazing phenomena in India, even for India. So why worry about others, oh crazy mind? See, just uh, know that the Lord ordains everything. 
without exception. In these three worlds, here he's talking about these worlds in the mind, right? The Bur, Buvar, Swar Lokas, or the Muladhara, Swadhisthana, Manipura chakras, if you wish. We looked at those teachings. In these three worlds, it is only association with the holy that is most worthy. That's that holy company you want to make sure you go to, you take your friends and family to, you make your children learn from, so that these negative samskaras that are in the mind will not fructify, and you can actually dis dissipate them, dissolve them in this lifetime, and be free in this very lifetime, as the Upanishads tell them. So the holy are providing you with the boat to carry you across the sea of birth and death. Beautiful, huh? So with that, you can see what he's talking about right here at this level of the chart. Samsara Pragbara, a major nadi for body-bound souls. What is a nadi? It's a subtle nerve, and it conducts a current called prana, psychic prana, if it's more refined, shakti, if it's even more refined, kundalini shakti, if it's supremely refined or at its, at its best. So you can see here, if we look at the bottom of this chart, with its backdrop, that there's the Borloka earth, and radiating out of earth are these souls that have a chance to go beyond the three worlds, as Shankara just sang to us. Because samsara pragbara means rounds of birth and death in samkara, samskara. A pragbara is a dam of souls. So it's getting dammed up, and they're getting sent back to earth. Some of them, oh, see there in that, that brain image there, there are lower nadis still for souls taking animal births. And then lower still, nadis for prana-based entities. So things in nature are going back to nature. They're coming back out of nature. But as this image shows, it's all happening in the mind. Even the earth itself happened from the mind. So you can see the mind and its, hab and its nadis there. There are hundreds and thousands of them. There, you know, we could ara eva ratana bao samhatar natta yajaha sa ishon jasterate bhuta jayamanaha om ichevam jayasa atmanam. Just of the saying is. In the, in the heart where everything centers are 100,000 nerves, at least. And inside of them are 100,000 more. So you can see how delicate this is um, and how subtle it is and how intricate it is and how everything is contained back inside of itself in a finer and finer degree until finally, so fine that basically um, it dissolves, as we've been talking about here, and dissolves into the ocean of consciousness itself. Now, if we, in the minutes remaining, we can take up at least part of this chart, because next class I can let you in on the fact that these three inset boxes, I'm going to spend the rest of the fifth class of this series, which is the final class of this series, going through some of these, we can do a review of this first one first. The interpersonal causes. For this dire effects of Vismriti, see the cause of loss of divine memory over lifetimes. This really centers in on the topic of our five class series here. So you can see the interpersonal causes are quickly Ad dharma, neglecting neglect in taking wisdom teachings. Therefore, many of us are rushing to India, as Vivekananda has said, to uncover again and remember and recall and recite and memorize the teachings of the dharma, uh, because India is replete with so many systems. Uh, and and uh, for instance, like yoga and Vedanta being two of the most powerful. 
So many of us are rushing to those ancient teachings of the Vedas and the Upanishads so that we make sure that those are planted in our minds in this lifetime and we put our attentions on them so they become just like like nutrition, nutrients in food get digested and into our organs and so forth, that in our mind, into our nadis, these wisdom teachings get digested and become part of our thinking process so that you're actually born thinking enlightenment or that I was never bound. Uh, and you pass away thinking, I will never die. Uh, some of these samskaras in you are very powerful and very spiritual in nature. Some of the causes for Vishmriti, Adharma then, and Trishna, thirst for the worlds of name and form. Trishna is thirst. So you want to, they want to come back again, again, it's like this image below says, uh, body bound souls going uh, to, through the three worlds and back to earth with the ancestors. There's the word we looked at so deeply, samskaras, fixation with caste, conventions, and families. Those may be there, but you want to make sure and lessen their hold on you. Uh, strike off their fetters, bonds it, bind thee down of shining gold or darker baser ore, as Vivekananda says. So you de-emphasize the accent on those things in fact, you try and um, teach everyone in caste and in family to go beyond religious convention and take up this truth of the Dharma or the Paravidya, we sometimes call it in India. Then Parigraha is also a cause. That's the illusion of earning, hoarding, and spending. That has to do with, with wealth. We'll look at these a little closer next week because we're ending up the class with this. The Ashana Trium, famous, or let's call it infamous, clinging to wealth, spouse, and offspring. Then again, those may be there, and they could be great aids to one person, Vivekananda says, but they could be great detriment to others. So it depends on the quality of the consciousness and the freedom from things like samskaras, thirst for life and the problem of not studying a dharma. We looked at those in the samskara chart as being problems. So take those away, then well, spouse and offspring can be dharmic. They can be free of thirst and they can actually help you develop positive samskaras and give you a parigraha. Then dukkha, belief in the substantiality or actuality of suffering. That suffering, remember, was one of those samskaras in our samskara chart that, that works itself deep into the um, subtle tissues of the mind. It'll plant itself deep like a tick, you see. And you'll think suffering is real, suffering is real. On the other side, you'll have pleasure trying to defeat it. And so Father of Yoga has been talking about pain and pleasure, these two dualities as being something that create a very uh, powerful residue in the mind. Attachment and aversion, he called it. So people are born with attachment to things that aren't good for them and aversion to things that aren't. Like aversion to study, for instance, as we just said, or aversion to Dharma. And so those come with a package when you're born. And so you see people who are lazy, they won't study. They're not interested in the Dharma. They won't find out about their true self or even learn about the goal of enlightenment or come to know that they're on this samskara, samsara, pragbara loop. Then there's what's called sadurmi, as if all of this wasn't enough. Hunger, thirst, grief, delusion, decay, and death. Birth, growth, disease, old age, decay, and death is how Vedanta would put that. That's a, a Buddhist term there. So both Buddhism and Vedanta agree about these six transformations. This also helps, uh, causes the soul to believe that suffering is real and that the world is real because they're having these experiences and they seem so very real to them. But if they were detached from them and they didn't identify with them, 
then they would be lessened and lessened and lessened, like reducing a charge through a wire by just turning a pot. And all of a sudden, the world seems like a mart of joy rather than a prison house of suffering. This is Ramakrishna. It's a prison house of suffering to some, but it's a mart of joy to others. How do we explain that? Jagad Mitya, that's a great Vedantic term, assume, assuming that the world is the only reality. If you put Brahman Satya in there, then you'd have the right perspective. Remember, right orientation was a part of those good samskaras. So if you come into this life and with a mind that has right orientation, which is one of the eightfold uh, aspects of the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, Four, Four Noble Truths, then you're on the right footing. And then finally, there's Vikshepa, dull sleep, vacuous thought, empty speech, and worldly sounds. Uh, the Upanishads talk about these too. So we'll pick that up next week. We'll, we'll start there. Um, and uh, depending on our timing, then we won't spend a lot of time with that because those are fairly known to most of my students. Um, but we should look more at this cosmic and collective causes for, for uh, forgetfulness. Because remember, the whole thing we're talking about here is what's making us forget our chain of lifetimes, which is just mentioned in the Upanishads and the Gita and Buddhism as if it were just the most natural thing in the world. But how do I bring these lifetimes in ignorance to a close. And how do I have my first conscious birth, conscious death, conscious birth? And then how, how, how I'm talking about here as we end this class, right, with methods. How then am I going to gain this pearl of great price? Am I going to enter into samadhi? Um, and um, have this superlative non-dual realization of the highest order, which of course will take me beyond birth, life, death, and rebirth. So here we've covered a lot, and I hope it's been helpful. We'll end our class series next Sunday with the rest of this chart, with some other teachings that go along with it. As we close in more on that uh, conclusion, of um, Vishmriti. Why is it that we're so forgetful? And uh, how can we begin to retain and bring back all the benefit of everything we learned in the past lifetime, rather than just regurgitating in this lifetime the same old things again? That's called convention, as we just looked at. And it seems to be what, what castes and creeds and families and ancestors are all into. So how can we retain that and hold it and keep it and thus awaken ourselves to divine reality in this very lifetime? <clears throat> so Om Brahmanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Ganamurtim Dandvaititam Gagana Sadrasham Tattvama Shadi Laksham Ekam Nicham Vimala Machalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavatitam Triguna Rahitam Sadgarum Tannamami Om Shantihi, Shantihi, Shantihi. <clears throat> we salute the leader of our souls, through whose grace our ignorance is destroyed, who is beyond good and bad, life and death, pleasure and pain, and all the pairs of opposites. We realize that one as the only witness to the changing phenomena of this universe, May we, through that grace, go beyond darkness and delusion. Realize the truth in this very life. Om peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto us, peace be unto all. Om Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om Tat Satam.